you're looking at faraway galaxies to try and figure out what's making these waves, what they're made of, what's going on. But we're sitting in the middle of one. Can you st is the fact that we're sitting in the middle of a spiral galaxy any help to you? It's really not just because we are sitting in the middle of it. So, it, I mean, even in, the, in these cases where you're looking at some distant galaxy, it's actually quite hard to disentangle these effects because in order to figure out how fast this wave's moving around, I have to sort of somehow compensate for all the motions of all the individual stars and so on. So even when you can sort of see the big picture of a galaxy, it's a pretty tough challenge to figure out how fast these waves are travelling around. When you're actually sat in the middle of a galaxy and you really don't get that big picture perspective at all, it's completely impossible. Do pattern speeds have numbers and units, or is that not what they are? You can. I mean, in, in, in simple terms, you're basically measuring how many degrees per second the galaxy goes round. Now, because it takes hundreds of millions of years for a galaxy to rotate, the number of degrees per second that it rotates at is a tiny number. So that's not usually the unit that you actually use. But that really is the, the fundamental unit, is radians, or the unit of, a, of angle per second, or degrees per second, is really what you're measuring. And what are some of the figures on a few of the famous galaxies? So, it's a very hard quantity to quantify, and as I say, you don't usually measure it in radians per second. The units you use, somewhat confusingly, are kilometres per second per kiloparsec. Okay, so kilometres is a unit of length per second per unit time per kiloparsec, which is another unit of length. So you can see it's actually is a, it actually has a unit overall, so those two lengths kind of cancel each other out, and that, that leaves you with a time to the minus one, or one over time in there. Um, and in those units, the numbers typically come out as 10 or 30 or 100. Um, and that's the reason why we use those units, is just because the numbers come out as sensible rather than 10 to the minus 73 or something that, that it might well come out if you use some other unit. There's one further subtlety here, which is that we've developed the technique to a point where we can actually not only measure a pattern speed for a whole galaxy, but see whether the pattern speed actually varies with position in the galaxy. In other words, it sort of goes back to this winding paradox. Are these things really sort of set structures that just sit there for hundreds of millions of years, or is the pattern actually evolving? Are different bits of the pattern going around at different speeds? And again, the slightly surprising result we found from that is that the answer is it depends which galaxy you look at. Some of them do seem to have these nice sort of set patterns that are set for, for all time. Other galaxies seem to be evolving very quickly. Um, and so if you, were, you know, if you were an alien who lived in that galaxy and you went off on a tour of the universe, when you came back, you really wouldn't recognise your galaxy at all because in a matter of a few hundred million years, its spiral structure would have changed completely. And again, one of the things we're really just beginning to come to grips with is why this is the case. Why is it that some galaxies seem to have this nice set spiral pattern, whereas in others it really is changing very quickly indeed. So what we're actually, the measurement you actually make is again just measuring how fast the stars are moving. And the way you measure the, way, the speed at which stars are moving is by measuring the Doppler shift in their light. So you take a spectrum of a star and you see whether the light from it is shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum, which tells you the star's coming towards you. The red end of the spectrum tells you the star's going away from you. And so you can measure the speeds, at least the line of sight speeds, of the stars that make up a galaxy reasonably easily. Um, but of course that doesn't tell you directly what the pattern speed is because that just tells you how fast the galaxy is rotating and as we've just seen, the speed at which different bits of a galaxy is rotating is not directly related to how fast this wave is travelling around the galaxy. So then the subtler part is that you put together some maths together with that uh, measurement of the speeds of all the stars to actually, t if you like, take out the, the overall rotation of the galaxy and see what's left over and what's left over tells you about how fast the, the pattern of the stars is actually changing and, and rotating around the galaxy. In the world of astronomy, is this a big deal and really interesting, or is this a little bit of a niche that you find interesting? That's a good question. It's a, um, it, it's a niche in the sense that it's a measurement that hasn't been made very often because it's actually quite a hard measurement to make. But the nice thing about it is it's not just an end in itself. You know, we don't just learn about by studying the speeds at which spiral patterns travel around in galaxies. We don't just learn about the speeds at which spiral patterns travel around in galaxies. The ambition is you then use that as a tool to study other properties of the galaxy, like how the dark matter is distributed within it, how stars form within the galaxy, because they seem to be associated with the spiral arms and so on. So it sort of fits in, it is in itself a niche, but it sort of fits into a bigger picture. And the results you get out of that niche actually have implications for, for much wider areas of astronomy. In the early part of the 20th century, before people had figured out that galaxies were actually at large distances away, there was actually a measurement that had been made which seemed to show that a galaxy had actually rotated in, you know, basically the way they tried to measure rotation at that point was you take a photograph, you wait 10 years, and then you take another photograph. And the, there was a measurement which seemed to show that even on that fairly short time scale, one of these spiral nebulae, as they were called, had actually rotated. And the reason why that was sort of important at the time is because from that you could actually infer how quickly the stars were travelling around and how quickly the stars are travelling depends on how far away this thing is. If it's small and relatively nearby, 
then the speed at which these stars are moving is actually quite small. But if it's at really at huge distances away, if it's a sort of is a, an island universe, a galaxy in its own right, then that relatively small amount of rotation translates into a huge speed. And in fact, the speed that they inferred was greater than the speed of light. And since even early in the 20th century, they knew that nothing could travel faster than light. This was actually an argument that was used to say that these spiral nebulae have to be relatively small and nearby. They can't actually be galaxies in their own right. Now, it turns out that the measurement was wrong. It's just an incredibly difficult measurement to make in order to measure those tiny little rotations. Um, and in fact, there wasn't any real rotation there at all. Um, but yes, people have been trying to measure, make this measurement for a pretty long time now. So those lovely arms that I see in a spiral galaxy that I've always thought of as almost being like a gymnast with a ribbon rushing behind her aren't, aren't that at all. No, probably the way to think of them is really as a wave. It's a wave of, of, of dens a density wave, a compression wave that's traveling through the galaxy. And the, the, the elegant thing that it does is as it travels through, of course, this wave compresses the gas and compressing gas is what causes stars to form. And so actually what you're really seeing is this, the effect of this wave traveling through is it's sort of lighting the galaxy up as it goes. It's making new stars form. It depends where you look in the galaxy, but typically they're going at some point in the galaxy, the wave will be traveling at a few hundred kilometers per second. So sort of comparable in speed to the speed at which the stars are also traveling around the galaxy. And one last question about these waves. Is this a theory? Is this just a theory about galaxies, or is there now no doubt that this is what makes spiral arms? It's, it's both. It's a theory in the sense that there is no definitive proof that what's going on is indeed at this basic spiral density wave picture, but there is so much evidence now lined up that, that, that supports the idea that we know that it's at least part of the story. Whether there's something else which is sort of contributing to the formation of, of uh, spiral arms, like magnetic fields or interactions with neighbours, or you know, the star formation itself, for example, can actually start producing a spiral arm. Um, the, these could all be aspects of it as well, but it's clear that at least part of the story is this spiral density wave picture. But the one thing that you, you don't know is where the wave originates, if it originates from inside or outside the galaxy. It's a very good question, and in some cases, you know, there's a, there's a smoking gun. In the case of the Whirlpool galaxy, it has this little neighbour, which clearly is connected with the spiral structure. In other cases, you have nice spiral structure, and there's no evidence for any companion at all. And so something internal to the galaxy then must be generating the waves. Um, but again, it's clearly rather a complicated picture. There's different aspects of what causes the, star, causes the, the spiral structure to form. You talk about galaxies here like pots in your kitchen or computers <laughs> on your desk. Do you sometimes stop and think about the size of these things and the power of these waves and the size of these waves and think, I really can't imagine how big these things are? Or does it, is it just all academic now? <laughs> It's actually when I make videos like this, that's the time when you take that step back. Because when you're doing these calculations, you know, these really rather involved calculations to calculate the pattern speed of a particular galaxy and so on, you get so buried in the complexities of what you're doing that you, don't, you lose sight of that kind of awe, that big picture of it. And it's really only when you come to talk about it that you suddenly realise quite how amazing some of these things really are. It's one of those things I can come up with explanations, I can come up with nice scale pictures and I can tell you that, you know, if the sun were the size of, of a, a, a marble, a small ball, you know, ball bearing, then the next nearest star would be 50 miles up the road. And at that level, you know, I can kind of get some sense as to quite how ridiculously big these things are. Um, but it's all just sort of analogy. It really, it's very hard to get a, a, a real picture of quite how big things are.